Father, we thank you for this hour. And we thank you for power available for every situation. Lord, I pray you open the windows of heaven. And you shower, you pour your blessings upon your people in Jesus' name. There will be no lack. There will be no limitation. Abundance of your blessings you will pour upon everyone in Jesus' name. No disappointment. But Lord, you will fulfill the desires of your people. Do it in every life, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Headquarters, Lagos, Amen. God bless you. We're looking at Psalm 65 and verse 2. Psalm 65, verse 2. O oh, thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. O oh, thou that answers prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. O oh, thou that responds to every prayer. Unto thee shall the Gentiles and the Jews come. Unto thee shall the men and the women come. Unto thee shall the high and the lowly come. Unto thee shall the sinner and the sage come. Thou that hearest prayer, Unto thee shall all flesh in all nations come. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall the people in the past dispensation and the people in the present dispensation and the people in the future generation all flesh come. Here the Lord is assuring us that is the one who hears, responds, and answers to prayer. Prayer is the means of fellowship with the Creator. He created you, created me, created, created us all. And the link between the creature and the Creator, that's prayer. Prayer is the link between the oppressed and the redeemer, captives, slaves, who could not free themselves, and they're looking for a power beyond themselves to set them free. Prayer is a link between the captive and the redeemer. Prayer is a chain, the link, the wire that connects the needy and the benefactor. The one who is able to supply all our needs, whatever the needs may be. Prayer is the link between the children and the Heavenly Father. He makes us his own children. We're saved. We're born again. We come into the family of God. And we need a link between us and the Heavenly Father. That's prayer. Prayer is the link between the sinner and the Savior. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me, save me, rescue me out of this body of sin and death? Prayer is the chain and the link that links the sinner and the Savior. Prayer is a connection between the impoverished, those who are in abject poverty between them and the provider. Prayer is a connection between the people who are fainting and the sustainer. He gives us life. He sustains that life. If we're going to have the life sustained, the experience is sustained, a link with the Creator. A connection with the Redeemer. It's a road that leads to the benefactor. A relationship with the Father. 
and then a touch of the Savior. Then the provider for him to get the needs unto us and the sustainer. That's why we pray. Prayer is the privilege of communication between heaven and earth. Heaven is full. The earth is empty. Heaven is rich. The earth is poor. Heaven is light. The earth is all darkness. Heaven is liberation and freedom. The earth is bondage. And for us to have the fullness of heaven and the glories of heaven in this poor, deprived world, we need prayer, which is a connection between the earth and heaven. Prayer is asking. Prayer is pleading. Prayer is confessing. Prayer is seeking. Prayer is pledging. Prayer is receiving from God. Prayer is praising God. As we commune with God, as we send our SOS, save our soul, we send that to the Heavenly Father. As the sick is touching the great physician, as the captive is touching the deliverer and the liberator, the means of touch is that prayer. Prayer is seeking and receiving forgiveness. Prayer is seeking and receiving salvation. Prayer is seeking and receiving grace. And prayer is seeking and receiving hell. Prayer is seeking and receiving righteousness. Prayer is seeking and receiving strength. Prayer is seeking and receiving inheritance. Prayer is seeking and receiving the fulfillment of the promises of God. That's why we pray. Where men and women in need, we must pray. Where men and women at a crossroads, we must pray. Where men and women that have not been able to achieve our goals, we must pray. Where men and women that are retarded, that are hindered from getting to the place we want to get to, we must pray. Where men and women who are confused because of all the situations and vicissitudes of life, we must pray. Where men and women in need of heavenly wisdom, we must pray. Where men and women that of all the things we have done, we have tried, we have run, we have walked, we have shouted, we have climbed, we have done everything, we are not able to reach our goals by ourselves, we must pray. That's why we pray. That's why the Lord is calling everyone, men and women, Jew and Gentile, and He's saying, O thou that hearest prayer unto thee, shall all flesh come. In Psalm 55, verse 17, Verse 55, verse 17, evening and morning and at noon will I pray. It says, in the morning I will pray. As if that's not enough, at noon I will pray. And that's still not enough, in the evening I will pray. It supplies strength. It strengthens the weak. It lifts up the falling. He restores what we have lost. He gives joy to the sorrowful. He gives victory to the de defeated. He gives experiences of the heart that makes the heart to come alive. He gives unto us. Therefore, in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, we pray. There are dangers in the morning. There are arrows that fly at noon time. And there are spirits that walk in the night. And there are powers that try to impede and hinder and stop our progress. Morning, afternoon, and evening, we must pray. It calls us to prayer. It calls us to seeking Him and finding Him. And it calls us so that we'll be able to receive what He has granted unto us. We pray today because of the journey ahead of us. And because of the future that we have. Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 9. 
It says, and it was three days without sight, neither did, did eat nor drink. That's talking about Saul. Three days without sight, neither did he eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street, which is called straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, not Judas Iscariot, that one was dead already, Inquire the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, tell me out loud, tell me out loud, use the preacher's voice and tell me, for behold, he prayed that man knew he met the Lord on the way to Damascus. He just got saved a few hours before that time. A few days before that time. He just got saved recently. And then the Lord already was telling him, I will show you the things you will endure for me. You will suffer for me. You will do for me. You will work for me. And he knew the journey was long. And he knew the load will be heavy. And he knew the mountain will be steep. And he knew the enemies will be strong. And he knew the powers that will stop him. He knew that political power, religious power, power from Rome, power from Jerusalem will try to stop him. He knew that except he contacted the one who has called him. He called him, he contacted him in prayer. He will not be able to reach his goal. You will reach your goal. You will reach your goal. The goal is higher than your thoughts. The goal is bigger than your thoughts. What the Lord has for you in the future is much, much greater than you ever imagined. But you will have power for your hour. Power every day. Power in every difficulty. Power in every challenge. And Paul and Saul knew that the journey was long. And therefore, he had not even received a sight. How do I get my sight back? He was, he was confused. How do I get restored fully? He said, so I've been fighting and kicking against the bricks. Why did I do that? And then he went to prayer and God said, behold, he prayed. You will pray. And God will answer your prayer. That mighty change and that mighty transformation and that mighty possession you are aiming at, he will give you more than you are asking. That's why today we're talking about powerful, the powerful effect of prevailing prayer. The powerful effect of prevailing prayer. Three things to consider. Number one, fervent prayer for indispensable Christian possession. Fervent prayer for indispensable Christian possession possession. Number two, fair perception of identifiable conditional promises. The promises that we can identify the conditions attached to them. You need to have a fair perception of those identifiable conditional Promises. Number three, firm persuasion. Firm persuasion with importunate, concentrated prayer. Firm persuasion, unshakable faith, you'll have faith in God. Unshakable confidence, you'll have confidence in God. Immovable trust. In the Lord, with importunate, concentrated prayer. The time has come 
for weakness to get out of your life. The time must come for you to say, all that I desired, I held on to God in prayer, and God did it for me. He will bless you. He'll bless your wife. He'll bless your husband. He'll bless daddy and mommy. He'll bless your children. You'll be victorious. We'll be victorious in Jesus' name. Number one, fervent prayer. For indispensable Christian possessions. Now many people that do not understand, when we talk about prayer, you see there are many promises in the Bible. And we can go to one, each of those promises. They are varied and they are different, one from the other. There are blessings and benefits, temporal. There are blessings and benefits, eternal. It is for you to say, look at this promise. It will last me for one day. Our daily bread. Look at this promise. It might last me for 40 years. The manner that he gave them in the wilderness. Look at this promise. This will last me for eternity. I give unto you eternal life. And no man can pluck you out of my hand. The blessing for a day, the blessing for a week, the blessing for a month, the blessing for a year, the blessing for 40 years, the blessing for a lifetime, the blessing for eternity. You need to make your choice. And you need to understand that when people pray, it is not everything they pray for that are of equal value. Look at the healing of the heart. The saving of the heart. And look at the relief of pain from your finger. When God heals your heart, cleanses your heart, touches your heart, prepares your heart for eternity and glory, that's a great blessing. When God heals your finger that is painful, that has a particular injury, that's a great miracle too. But the healing of the finger cannot be compared with the transformation of your heart. That's why we're talking about indispensable Christian possession. You think about securing a place of abode here in your city. That's a great miracle. You pray and it gives you land. And then you build a house. And you have a place, a secure place in your community. That's a miracle that's answered to prayer. You think about the answered prayer of having a place in heaven. My father's has so many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Securing a place in heaven. Securing a place on earth. There's a difference. You order your priorities. You say, this is greater. That's the problem Esau had. Esau could not differentiate the value of the birthright and the importance of one meal. And because he thought, this is what I need now. The need of a moment and the need of a day. The meal of just a moment. He thought that was what he needed. He despised the birthright. Salvation. Grace for victory over temptation. Humility and favor with God. God's presence and peace with God. Holiness of heart. Readiness for heaven, strength to overcome every temptation, the power of the Holy Ghost within, the power to always resist the devil and overcome the devil. All those things are greater than temporal, earthly blessings. 
That's why we pray wisely. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. What do you need from verse 12? Isaiah chapter 1 verse 12. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand to tread my courts? These Israelites, they didn't know that first of all, the priority of prayer is to settle our relationship with God. Ask him for this, ask him, he'll give those things, he'll give those things. Those things are even necessary for us to live here on earth. But the priority, the first thing, the indispensable Christian possession. Look at verse 16. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment, justice. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together. See what he's saying? He's saying, Heaven puts priority on the important things in prayer. It says, do this first. Handle this first. Deal with this first. Possess this first. After that, come now. And let us reason together, says the Lord. Let your sins be as scarlet. They shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, tell me. I can't hear my people. Ye shall eat the good of the land. There are many people, they don't read the whole sentence. Verses 19 and 20 make one sentence. But... If ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devout of the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. It wants us to first of all settle our relationship with Him. The Creator is passionate about relationship with His creature. The Creator is thirsty desire us about relationship with his creatures he doesn't want those creatures to stay far away and then the creatures are saying creator i'm far away send healing transfer some money to this account transfer strength I'm busy here. I don't have any time to worship you. I don't have any time to relate with you. I'm over here. But I know you are my creator. Send some hell. He doesn't want that. He wants you to come near. He wants you to have fellowship with him. He created you for himself. He wants you to glorify him. That's why he says, First of all, come now. And let us reason together, says the Lord. And then he says, do your sins be as college. The things that separate you from me, I will forgive you. I will cleanse you. We're looking at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Reading from verse 31. It says, therefore, take no thought. Saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be closed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But seek ye. What's the next word there? I said, What's the next word there? But seek ye, tell me. But seek ye, tell me out loud, first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. All these things, what's that? 
clothing, food, shelter, certificate, money, temporal needs, earthly desires, husband, wife, children, earthly possession. It says, seek ye for the kingdom of God. You remember? Except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Seek ye for the kingdom of God. Being born again. You remember? The kingdom of God is not food, it's not meat and drink, but peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It says a righteousness and joy in the Holy Ghost. It says seek that, the peace, the righteousness, and the joy and the power and the assurance in the Holy Ghost. Seek that first for the kingdom of God. It says, let us see grace whereby we'll be able to serve God and enter into his kingdom. It says, seek that strength first, salvation first, holiness first, Holy Ghost power first. And then it says, after that, all these things shall be added unto you. The denominations surround us. The denominations on television, the denominations on radio, the denominations over the internet, they have changed our understanding. They have twisted the words of Jesus Christ. They have lodged the key of the door of knowledge and they have taken the key away because they have reversed, they have turned around the words of Jesus. Prosperity is number one before salvation. Healing, number one before salvation. And the things of this earth, number one before the Holy Ghost power. And the things we see, and the things we touch, and the things we taste, and the things that give us pleasure, they are number one in the minds of the people rather than the kingdom of God. And we're following after them. If a church does not emphasize material things, material blessing, and they earthly pursuit, it's like, what kind of church is that? They don't recognize the words of Jesus. They don't recognize what Christ has said, that you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and that after that, all these things shall be added unto you. There are things of priority. There are things that come in the mind of God. There are things that come in the heart of the Lord as number one. And then, if you are in a relationship with the Lord, you obey the Lord, you put as number one. What Christ says, we put as number one. Your salvation will heal you. It can do that almost at no time, any time. Leave that alone. And then your prosperity, he can do that. He's done that for many people. He'll get that done. Leave that alone for us and seek your relationship with the Lord. Make sure you are born again. Make sure your life is turned around. And that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, make sure that is in place. He'll do it for you in Jesus' name. Did I get an amen over there? Yeah. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 16. Luke chapter 12. Verse 16. It tells us, and he spake a parable unto them. Before I read that parable to you, let me look at, let me read the previous verse. Verse 15. Take heed and beware of covetousness. I read that to you to say this to you. How do you describe covetousness? How do you define covetousness? What do you understand by the word covetousness? You might say, I don't covet anything belonging to another person. That's your definition. Look at the parable now. 
and he gave this parable to them so that they will understand the definition, his own definition of covetousness, his description of covetousness and the danger that covetousness posts in your life, in my life, in every life. Verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain man brought forth plentifully. No evil, no stealing, no grabbing what belongs to other people. The ground of a certain man, it belongs to him, brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. It's not taking anything belonging to anybody. It's not taking anything belonging to a neighbor, belonging to a community, belonging to the government. This is all his. And all this thinking is not trying to oppress another person to get anything. And the Lord is describing covetousness. And he says, I don't have any room to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I'll pull down my bars and build greater. And there will I bestow all my goods, all my fruits and my goods. You understand covetousness? When your planning, your desire is only, I must get this, I must get this, I must get that. A man of the earth, a woman of the earth, there is no concept of the future. There's no concept of heaven. There's no concept of that eternal home where Christ has gone to prepare for us. And then he says, And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Do you see covetousness there? No, you can't see, but Christ can see. And that's the parable he gave to say that when the hearts of men are after sand and cement, the hearts of men, they are after naira and dollars and pound study. The hearts of men, they are material as things and the things they pursue. And the things they run after. And the things they dream after. And the things they must have. They're not even competing with other people. It's just that I have a dream, I have a goal, I have a desire, I have a plan, I have a pursuit. I must get it. And Jesus said, that's his definition. That's his description of covetousness. When you cannot moderate your desires, build house in every stage. Have house everywhere. And litter the whole place with your own property. Say, but God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Look at the conclusion of Christ. So, so, it's telling us a story. It's painting a picture. He's telling us a parable. And now he's applying the parable. And he said, so is he. Of course, so is she. So is the man. So is the woman. So you see, that lays up treasure for himself. And is not rich toward God. Not rich in relationship with God. Not reach is sal salvation that comes from God. Not reach in holiness. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Not reach in faith, trusting God for tomorrow. It says, so is every man. At the end of the day, he will be a fool. I pray that will not happen to you. I thought you'll say, good, good, amen. Mark chapter 8. In Mark chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 36. Mark chapter 8, verse 36. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world 
and lose a so and so if it were possible for you to have all the money in all the banks in this city if it were possible for you to have all the money in all the banks in this nation if it were possible for you to have all the money in the banks of the whole world and you are the sole proprietor of everything that we have on earth and you lose your soul no salvation for eternity you've amassed everything here on earth and you never thought you're not going to carry that thing beyond the grave and the age will come and he's saying when we pray we set our priorities we say that will be number one that will be number two that will be number three and some of the things you're looking for you're searching for and you're running after they're number 192 and unfortunately many people they jump number one number two number three number four in importance in priority and they go to number 192 and that is what they're seeking after and if you got that thing and you didn't have number one if you died you'll die in miserable death it will not happen to you you seek the kingdom of God and you seek the favor of God and you seek what will take you, what will take you to that final age in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, I'm reading here from verse 14. Follow peace with all men. You ever see, do you, do you think that's a, that's a great request? Uh, there are people that you, they always have loggerheads with you. And you don't ever think I should say all that. You're always misunderstanding them. They're always misunderstanding you. You're always fighting them. They're always fighting you. You're always uh, contradicting each other. It's like, you know, your heart in the day, in the night, is always on them. And their mind is always on you. And there's nothing else they're pursuing. They want to see your downfall. And you want to see their defeat. And the Lord is saying, if you're going to seek anything at all, as you come to this retreat, the number one thing, follow peace with all men. Remember that man. Mention the name. Remember that woman. Mention the name. Remember, when I see him, when I see her, it's like, you know, even without us talking at all, the fight has started again. It says, follow peace with all men. You don't know when you are going to die. And if there's anything urgent, anything important, it is this peace of heart, peace with God, peace in your soul, and peace with all your neighbors, and peace everywhere. Follow peace with all men, and tell me. Follow peace, what's the next word? All holiness. I said, is it all holiness? What is it? I said, what, it, what is it? Well, well, we're running around. I'm seeking this. I about and holiness. I want this. And holiness. I want that. And holiness. And that's not a commodity you find in the world. It's not a commodity you find even in many churches. But it says, follow it, pursue it, persevere in seeking after it, run until you reach, and go after until you get, until it becomes permanent in your nature. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And then after that now, after we've got the essential thing, salvation, the important thing, holiness, sanctification, after we have got the power that overcomes every temptation and we know that if the trumpet sounds any time, we'll get over there. All the other things now, healing will come. Certificates will come. Houses will come. Wife will come. Husbands will come. Children will come. 
Okay, the one I've not mentioned, mention your own. Tell me what's your own. It's coming, it's coming. Tell me it will come in Jesus' name. And the Lord has given us promises. But we need to perceive, we need to understand the conditions that are attached to those promises. Fear perception. That's point number two. The fear perception of identifiable conditional promises. As you read the promises of God, you must identify the conditions attached to them. In Exodus chapter 15, Exodus 15, in verse 26, and said, if, that's what is important, and said, if, that's the condition, and said, if, that's what you need to perceive, understand, analyze, examine, that if this is done, then that will be done. Look at that again. And said, if thou will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, I will do that which is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep, and keep, and keep all his statutes. Then, you see the condition? If this happens, if you are not a careless worshipper, a carefree worshipper, if you are not an ignorant worshipper, if you hear my word, if you observe my sayings, if you give attention to what I tell you, then, he tells us, I will put none of those diseases upon thee, which have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. You see that condition there? Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28 is what makes the Christian pray intelligently. The people that pray unintelligently, they model everything together. Give me this, give me this. Can I tell you something? There are promises in the Bible given to the sinner for the sinners. There are promises for the backsliders. There are promises for the sons of God, sons and daughters of God. There are promises for the servants of God. They're like registered letters. And they're registered in your name. And you sign for it. And you open it. And the contents in the letter, they're just for you. There are people that indiscriminately they just open the bible and they look at a particular verse and they say that is mine hey there are promises for the sinners promises for the sons and daughters of god and promises for the daughters and for the servants of the lord let me illustrate it for you aaron could not have opened up the red sea only moses could have done that because god Give that instruction to Moses. He was leading the children of Israel. Stretch out your rod. Only Moses could have done that. Aaron could not have done that. You understand? Caleb could not have stopped the sun. He couldn't. He was a great man. He was a good man. He was a faithful man. It was not his son. It was for Joshua. Because Joshua was leading the army of the children of Israel. Only Joshua could have stopped that sun. You understand what we're saying? That Sarah could not have prayed for Abimelech for the barrenness in the house of Abimelech to be removed and reversed. Only Abraham could have done that. Because God said, restore to the man his wife and he will pray for you. God already identifies he's going to make the prayer. Elisha couldn't have forced opened river jordan first elijah must do it before elisha could do that and peter couldn't have caused the fig tree only christ could have done that at that time rebecca could not have conferred the blessing of the of the birthright on jacob 
only Isaac could have done that. When you read the promises of God, find out. It says for the sinner. It's this for the child of God. It's this for the minister of God. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1. It tells us in chapter 28, verse 1, about the promise of God and the condition. It says, and it shall come to pass. If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, and observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. Did somebody say amen? amen. But you see what, how it starts? If thou shalt hacking. If you don't block your ear, if you don't say, I'm not interested in the commandments. I'm not interested in duty. I'm not interested in responsibility. I'm not interested in righteousness. I'm not interested in obedience. All I'm interested in, I want the blessing. My friend, it doesn't come that way. If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. Tell me the next word there. I said, tell me the next word there. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. We will listen. We will hack him. And the Lord will bless us in Jesus' name. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7. We're reading from verse 14. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Are you there? I said, Are you there? Have you opened it? What's the first word there? If, if my people. You see that? Many people don't look at the conditions. I need to look at those conditions because God who wrote that thing and God who put it there is watching over the conditions. And he says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. Have you ever seen proud people going for prayers? I've seen a lot of them. Have you ever seen arrogant people? They're always from the tower. They're higher and greater than everybody. There's no submission to the watch of God. And they're coming for prayer. And they're coming and see if God owes them something. And they say, God, and they beat upon the table. Are you there? What are you looking at? I am suffering. I have this need. I have this need. I come to you now. If you are there, show me now that you are there. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves. You come out of that seat of pride. And you bend low in the sight of God. And you understand, you're a creature talking to the Creator. Or you're a child talking to the Father. Or you're a subject talking to the King. And it says, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then look at that. If this is done, and that is done, and that is done, then after that will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. The Lord will do it. If somebody said, as Old Testament time, that at this time now, age of grace, no condition. 
You think so? Come to the New Testament. We're looking at John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And I'm reading here from verse 14. 14, 14. It says, If ye shall ask anything in my name, if ye shall ask, to so start which you must ask, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. If you love, you profess to love me, I'm your child. I'm following after you. I'm born again. I'm sanctified. I'm having the holiness experience. All right. Show me by the life you live. And all the prayers you want to pray, there is an if, there is a condition. And you need to understand that condition. If you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father. And he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Chapter 15, John chapter 15 verse 7. What's the first word there? John chapter 15 verse 7, tell me the first word out loud. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you. You want to pray? If ye abide in me, if ye abide in him, you will not be stealing. If you abide in him, you will not be a drunkard. If you abide in him, you will not be a chain smoker. If you abide in him, you stay with your wife and you leave other people's wives alone. If you abide in him, fornication will not be in your life. If you abide in me, you will abide in righteousness. And he gives us the condition. And he says, Yes, you will pray. Yes, I will answer. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. There's a condition. He gives us that condition, and then he says, we abide in him, and we keep his word. And those promises will be yes and amen on your behalf, on our behalf today, in Jesus' name. Church, I said in Jesus' name. Number three now, firm persuasion. You come to the Lord in prayer. You know that he can meet that need. He's done it before. He's done it for people like you. He's done it in Bible days. He's done it in contemporary times. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. Whatever the need may be, and you come to him with assurance. You come to him with persuasion. You come to him with confidence. And you know, this is what he said he will do. He will definitely do it, do it in your life. He will not fail in Jesus' name. James chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5. James chapter 1 verse 5. If any, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. If any of you lack salvation, let him ask of God. If any of you lack holiness, let him ask of God. That's the source from where we get everything we get. If any of you lack healing, let him ask of God. If any of you lack sufficiency, let him ask of God. If any of you lack any spiritual sin or any natural sin or any physical sin, let him ask of God. That give it to all men liberally and upbraid it not and it shall be given you. It shall be given you this morning. You'll possess that possession this morning. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. Let him ask in faith nothing wavering. Why would he waver? He has promised. He has said he will do it. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He has promised it. He says, let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea. Driven with the wind and toss, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double minded man is unstable in all his ways. You'll not be stay unstable this morning in Jesus' name. You're fully persuaded. Say, I am fully persuaded. I'm fully persuaded. Somebody there, I am fully persuaded that my God will not fail. I am fully persuaded. That God will meet all my needs. I am fully persuaded 
that the promises of God will not fail in my life. It has happened in Jesus' name. In Romans chapter 4 verse 20. Romans chapter 4. We're reading from verse 20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. But was strong in faith. Giving glory to God. Already you are glorifying the Lord. You know a miracle is there today. The power of God is there today. The Lord is going to turn every circumstance in your life today in Jesus' name. Strong in faith, giving glory to God. I'm being partially, I'm being partially persuaded. I'm waiting for you. I'm being unsteadily provide, uh, persuaded. How? How was he persuaded? How are you persuaded? Do you know God is going to bless you this morning? Do you know God is going to change your circumstance this morning? How persuaded are you? I said how persuaded are you? Look at all the attacks and look at all the affliction of the past. Do you know everything is going to go away this morning? How persuaded are you? Look at the need of your life and look at the pressure of the world and the pressure of the flesh and the pressure of the devil and you're almost fainting, you are tired as if you cannot move forward again. Anybody persuaded there this morning? How persuaded are you? I said how persuaded are you? Stand on the edge of your problem and let me see you. Let me see how you stand. I said, let me see how you stand. I've been fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Able to perform. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. The heavens are open right now. Answers are showering down right now. And the grace of God, the power of God is coming down right now. Every need has been met right now. Prayers have been answered right now. Salvation is coming right now. Sanctification coming right now. Holy Ghost power coming right now. Healing coming right now. Children coming right now. Blessings coming right now. The heavens are opened. The heavens are opened. The heavens are opened. The heavens are opened. Persuaded. Persuaded, persuaded, fully persuaded, fully persuaded, fully persuaded, fully persuaded. Miracles are happening right now. Blind eyes are open right now. Limb legs are rising up and walking right now. Impossibilities are being possi made possible right now. Mountains are moving away right now. Something is happening. Something is happening. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Persuaded, persuaded, persuaded. I am fully persuaded. Tell him, tell him, tell him. Tell him he cannot fail. Tell him he will not fail. Tell him this is the moment of answered prayer. He'll do it. He'll do it. He'll do it. If my people are called by my name, if they will humble themselves, if they will see it, my faith, and they will call, and they will call upon him, he says, he will hear from heaven. He will hear from heaven. He's going to do it. 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 He cannot fail. He answered Abraham, he'll answer you. He answered Moses, he'll answer you. He answered Anna, he'll answer you. He'll an he answered Joshua, he'll answer you. He answered Paul, he'll answer you. He answered Peter, he'll answer you. He answered all the people that came. And they came as he had promised. They came as he had promised. They came as he had promised. And he answered them, and he answered them, and he answered them. And he has answered you today. And he answered you today. And it shall come to pass. It shall come to pass. It shall come to pass. That whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It shall come to pass. That whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And it shall come to pass. That whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be set free. It shall come to pass. That whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be answered. The answer is coming. The answer is coming. 
The answer is coming. Welcome the giver. Welcome the giver. Welcome the giver. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's been done right now. Roll away, he'll roll away every problem. He'll destroy every work of the devil. He'll do it. He'll do it. He'll do it. Persuaded, persuaded, persuaded. I'm fully persuaded. In Jesus' name we pray. A fully persuaded amen. Do you know you are receiving something right now? The request and desire of your heart you are receiving right now. Let there be no doubt in your heart, in your mind. Because this is the time and the moment of the power for your hour. Give me a good amen that is fully persuaded. Whatever the challenge or whatever the need, wherever you are right there. You are centering your mind and your heart on your creator, your savior, your benefactor, your redeemer, your deliverer, your supplier, your provider, your sustainer. He'll do it right now. Where are you there? Raise up that hand. When you hear the final amen, you can then begin to rejoice because it has happened. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you because we know that this is the day and this is the moment, the hour of answered prayer and the hour of the present power. Lord, I pray for everyone right now, whatever the needs are, open the windows of heaven, shower your blessings upon them in Jesus' name. Confirm that salvation for the sinner in Jesus' name. Confirm that restoration for the backslider in Jesus' name. Sanctification and holiness and purity for those who have sought you. Confirm it in Jesus' name. Power from on high. Power of the Holy Ghost. Power to be everything we ought to be. For the day of challenge, put it and shower it upon your people in Jesus' name. You promise to heal. You cannot fail. You will not fail. Lord, I pray you bring the healing to everyone. Let the healing virtues flow in everybody's life from the top of the head to the tip of the toe right now in Jesus' name. Whatever miracle is needed, Lord, you are the miracle worker. You are the wonder worker. I pray that you touch every life and you give it to them right now in Jesus' name. Roll those problems away. Impossibilities become possible. The mountains roll away right now. To my right, to my left, to my front, to my back, in the middle, anywhere you are, receive your miracle. Receive the healing. Receive the deliverance. Receive the freedom. Receive the power for your hour. Weakness is gone. All the backbone that was bent, everything is stretching out. Power in your soul. Power in your spirit. Power all over you. Power in your circumstances. Failure is gone. Fainting is gone. The strength of the Lord will see you through. And when you cross over, at the end of this year, you will not carry over any problem of the old year. You're free. You're delivered. His hand is upon you. You'll never be the same again. Present power. Prevailing power. Precious power. Perpetual power upon your life. Lord, confirm it for everyone. 
In Jesus' mighty name I pray.